First up, I'm very excited to welcome my boss, Shantanu Narayan, the CEO of Adobe, and Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. In the five years that he's been in Microsoft CEO, Satya has helped drive massive innovation, transform the culture, and increase Microsoft's stock price, making it one of the most valuable companies in the world. We're also fortunate that Microsoft is one of our biggest partners, sharing our vision to reimagine customer experience across every enterprise. Please join me in welcoming Shantanu and Satya. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. So Owen was born with a rare genetic disorder called Escobar syndrome. He's had 33 surgeries to date. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. What I like about the adaptive controller is now everyone can play. You can just say, all right, that's that button, that's that button, that's that button. Perfect. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. No matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. Please give another warm welcome to Satya Nadella. You know, when I see that ad, Satya, it's, it's just so inspiring. And, you know, you talk about the transformative impacts of technology. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the ad and you know, the reason for being. Yeah, I mean, there's a fa fascinating and really inspiring story for me personally even uh, in uh, how the team went about creating the adaptive controller. Uh, it was just a group of people in the Xbox team who just got very, very close, proximate with the community of gamers um, of different abilities and said, look, what can we do to help everyone play? And that led to the creation of this product. But the interesting thing, it was not even a sanctioned project. It basically came from a hackathon. They just persisted with it, created the product, said, here is the market. But the thing that was most inspiring, and it set a completely new bar for us, is in the packaging. So they didn't stop when they built the product. And they said, how do we go that extra step and make even the packaging accessible? Um, and that, I think, to me, is that empathy uh, that I think is at the core of all innovation. At least for me, uh, the more we can invoke our ability to meet the unmet, unarticulated needs, that's the source of innovation. And the source of that innovation comes by having a deep sense of empathy. Well, if it wasn't hard enough running a company of the size and scale of uh, Microsoft, Satya also wrote a book uh, in his first five years called Hit Refresh. And certainly one of the things you talk about there is empathy. But you also talk a lot about culture, Satya. I'd love uh, for you to share your thoughts on culture. I mean, there are two things, Shantanu, that I felt we needed to recommit ourselves to. Uh, we are now, Microsoft is, what, 44 years old. Um, Young. It's a sense of purpose in mission and culture. I felt like, you know, of course, as technology companies or any business, you've got to get a lot of things right. You've got to understand where the world is going, bet right long before it's conventional wisdom on tech trends, then ultimately deliver products that customers love. All that's a given. But then I said, okay, what is the real source of inspiration for getting those right? Or what are the necessary conditions to get your strategy and products right? And I felt like, well, one is a sense of purpose, and the other is culture. You know, when I joined Microsoft in the early 90s, we used to talk about our mission as a PC in every home and every desk. 
Uh, and in fact, by the end of the 90s itself, we more or less had achieved that objective, at least in the developed world. And ever since, we felt like, okay, what's that next big mission? So that's why when we talk about our mission of empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, it's not just a set of words, right? For us, it's got deep meaning. How do we choose to be in which markets? How do we show up with the products we build? And that sense of empowerment. Uh, is what we seek, whether it's the institutions or people. But then culture is so important because in some sense, if you want to keep reinventing yourself, you need that learning culture. And I would say, we, you know, I went on this massive quest of saying, okay, what are all the attributes of a learning culture? And luckily enough, whatever, maybe three, four years before I became CEO, my wife had introduced me to this book by Carol Dweck at Stanford called Mindset, and I read it more in the context of my children's education. But I got educated. In other words, I realized that, you know, if we can move from being this know-it-alls to learn-it-alls and maintain that posture, that probably more than anything else can help us. And those are the two things I would say have been very, very key to us. Well, one of the words I love to use, Satya, in that same context is intellectual curiosity and how can you, uh, you know, sort of infuse a company and a culture with intellectual curiosity. But what clearly has been staggering is the business transformation uh, that you have accomplished at Microsoft. And so maybe you can touch a little bit about, you know, uh, the business transformation itself. I mean, for us, uh, it's always one of the things that... Uh, we have learned and we now see that even as we talk about with our customers and partners is you've got to get two things right. One is you've got to have a first class worldview of where your industry is going, in our case where technology is going, uh, and what one can do with these new technology trends. But the tougher part is to adjust sometimes to the harsh realities of the business model shift. Uh, I always think that sometimes tech shifts are easier to deal with uh, than business model shifts. And in fact, you are an example. In fact, I, I studied you guys deeply uh, to learn about how you navigated that. Um, and so to me, uh, being able to get these two things right long before people give you credit, and that's kind of where ultimately all of us, I think, are measured by, is not what, you know, uh, going where people tell you to go when it's obvious, but how do you get there before uh, there's conventional wisdom? Uh, but I would say it is centered first and foremost in a, having a worldview of how you can uniquely add value to customers and partners. And that customer centricity, but at the same time knowing that it's not a direct line, but you have to make a leap, leap on the product and technology, a leap on business model, has been the key to our transformation. Well, one of the things uh, I know, the power of words, and when you have the power of words to align an organization as uh, large as as Microsoft around what a North Star is. And I think uh, you talk a lot about intelligent edge and intelligent cloud. So maybe you know a little bit about what uh, that means in the world of technology. I mean, it starts though with what we are fundamentally seeing. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm very, very fond of this uh, quote by, a uh, quote from Mark Weiser who worked at Xerox Park in the late 80s. Uh, and he was sort of the father of this notion of ubiquitous computing. And he talks about this notion of if computing got embedded in the world and just disappeared, uh, that's the world we imagine. Uh, and guess what? In 2019, we have that, right? I mean, if you think about how computing is getting diffused, dispersed, distributed. But the most interesting thing is the digital transformation that that ensues, right, which is whether you're talking to a retail customer or healthcare or manufacturing or CPG, pick your sector of the economy. It's all being transformed by the availability of computing power that is unique, you know, is more and more ubiquitous. So that's what this intelligent cloud and the intelligent edge fundamentally captures. But the thing that I've now come to realize is it's not just having a vision for what computing looks like. What is it that you can do with it? Which is, in, in some sense, this conference is all about those experiences right. that you are creating. How do you drive that deep personalization with trust so that your business can deliver what it's sort of fundamentally all about? Uh, and that's what Intelligent Cloud, Intelligent Edge means to us. You know, you touched on something which was, you know, different verticals and what happens as well as geographies and how you expand that. So maybe, you know, a little bit about how Microsoft thinks about 
what the impact of intelligent edge, intelligent cloud is, either in different sectors uh, of the economy or in different geographies? Absolutely. So if, first of all, I think it's probably worthwhile just to unpack at least what I think are the three layers of this intelligent cloud, intelligent edge. The first, of course, is the computing itself being more distributed. Uh, so that you have both the cloud and the edge. In fact, when I look at whether it's autonomous vehicles, autonomous warehouses, uh, the most interesting things that are happening are at the edge. The second, of course, is when you have a lot of compute, the thing that you do is AI. In other words, you reason over large amounts of data to create these next generation of experiences. And the breakthroughs that we are seeing uh, in fact, today is an interesting day. I mean, the, the three guys who won the Turing Award were all sort of the fathers of uh, deep learning, uh, which the breakthrough from, breakthroughs from 2012 to 2019 have been tremendous. Uh, in fact, just this year, well, some of the breakthroughs in language uh, are just so phenomenal. And the question is, how do you take these fundamental building blocks of AI and transform, you, you know, use them in the context of these various verticals? And then the last one is on the experience layer, and you see it with your products itself, right? It's no longer about a natural interface in one device. Uh, if you look at the HoloLens, it's pretty amazing to see what, is, what it's done for even UI. It's instinctual UI. But now it's not even about one device, but how can I have a meeting or a creative session uh, that is spanning all the devices uh, without even the space and time limit? So that, to me, is the breakthroughs. Now, let's take that and apply it to retail. Uh, now, let's take that and say, okay, how does the shopping experience on, you know, offline look like? The reality is offline plus online is going to be blended into one personalized shopping experience. Right. Uh, take manufacturing. I mean, one of the things which I feel uh, where we have a lot of tech intensity uh, is in manufacturing. Next week, there is uh, one of the largest uh, manufacturing shows that happens in Hanover. And you'll see how we're putting so much compute in the factory floor so that with all of the sensors out there, you can rendezvous that, you can even do sensor fusion at the edge so that your production lines are that much more efficient. The quality is that much more better. Uh, financial services, uh, people are really thinking about, okay, how can I even build new products? Uh, we were you know, partnered with BlackRock in creating a product where you know, Larry has a vision for saying, okay, I want to create a product for people saving for their retirement. We're using sort of techniques out of behavioral economics. So he's just got a complete vision of creating new products uh, using some of the same breakthroughs in AI. So that spectrum of innovation that's being unleashed is what I describe as tech intensity, where every company in every industry is taking these world-class breakthroughs and instantly converting it into some product or some service that changes the experience in their industry. It's so true. I mean, you talk about both the fundamental platforms, and you talked a little bit earlier about what you're doing vis-a-vis -vis the community and partners. And I, I think we've uh, certainly seen a, a sort of revival as well as an acceleration of the relationship between the two companies and the partnership. So maybe, you know, we'll uh, unpack that a little bit yeah. for the audience. Uh, maybe first about creative uh, and your perspective on creative. You were actually at Max yes, uh, in the first year. Ago. Exactly. I, I mean, I'm really excited about uh, what's happening in creative. I mean, look, I mean, the thing that most strikes me is when you do that attention to detail, like, for example, you take the parallax error or you really create a low latency input with low parallax error, and then put your software, right, for the creatives, and an amazing device, which in Surface we created. You just put the creative back in the flow of what they do, and it's so beautiful to watch even the output of what they do and so on. So I'm very, very excited about the partnership we have there, and more particularly the inspiration, I think, we now have of being able to take some of these breakthroughs, same things, by the way, which is these AI breakthroughs, on how do you bring more of this instinctual UI to unlock the creative, as I think you say, on, on, in, in each of us. That's right. Uh, which is so great and so powerful, and I'm excited about sort of the work we're doing there. We're also doing a bunch of stuff together as it relates to SharePoint and Outlook and everything around inefficient uh, paper-based processes and documents and you know, Adobe Sign yeah. in partnership with that, but how do you see this sort of world of digitization happening? I mean, it's part of transformation, but at some points it's also orthogonal. 
Yeah, I mean, it is, I think it's so important, right? We talk a lot about how we're going to do these wonderful things for customers and partners. In fact, one of the things that I always remind myself even is unless and until we can empower the people who work in our own enterprise with the best tools so that they can then have the pride in their craft, uh, it's very hard to do these other things. So empowering of your own people is, I think, a very important place. But that's kind of where, if you look at the work we are doing in teams, think about the creative process right. uh, and the integration between teams and the creative cloud or the marketing cloud. Uh, or the experience club. These are all the things that I think ultimately take friction out, get people to collaborate, communicate, so that the end product uh, is that much better. And so I'm very excited about the work we're doing around your document cloud, creative cloud, and, and marketing cloud with Microsoft's. Um, That's absolutely the case, because when you think about the number of stakeholders right now who are involved in the collaborative process, it sometimes exceeds the actual people who are creating the That's right. specific output. So you know, we're, we're just as excited about what we can do there, but perhaps the area we've uh, invested most jointly in is in the enterprise yeah. and what we are doing around enabling businesses uh, to digitally transform. Again, your perspective on uh, the partnership there. Yeah, I mean, obviously we are very, very excited to be the cloud layer across all of your clouds. and. What does that mean for customers, including ourselves, uh, is the ability to have the data asset across all of what customers are doing to help them build their own product, their own service. So ultimately, what is it that we're in business of? We want to help our mutual customers get better at them really connecting with their customers being able to transform the product or service that they're creating, optimize the operations. And so the work we're doing, uh, you know, for example, at uh, 24 Hour Fitness, which is an amazing example of uh, taking Dynamics 365 and the work you've done in the Experience Cloud, connecting the two on Azure so that they can now do member marketing that's super effective for them. Uh, what we are doing with Avianca, which is what they're large, you know, the, one of the largest airlines uh, in South America. In fact, I would just one of the nice factoids about them is that they're the world's second oldest uh, airline. And they are really rethinking how they do their marketing using all of these tools. Um, and to me, those are some of the real examples of how by breaking down these silos, bringing these products together, putting that capability in the hands of our customers, so they become digital companies in their own right. That's something that I feel both Adobe and Microsoft uniquely share as I think at the core of what we do is it's not about, I, I always say it's not about growing dependence on us. It's more of us enabling our customers to build their own digital independence with us. Uh, and that to me is I think at the core of what we're doing. We've just been as excited about it, Satya. I mean, you know, the first phase of uh, us leveraging Azure to, you know, do everything we did around the Adobe uh, Experience Manager and Adobe Campaign. And then I think uh, at your Ignite conference, we yep. said, let's take it to even uh, the next level uh, with Bill McDermott at SAP and what we've done around ODI. Uh, so maybe, you know, your perspective on the importance of ODI. I certainly shared it yesterday from my point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a... I'm very excited about uh, ODR. And fundamentally, it's for what I said a little while earlier. If you look at it, the greatest asset, though, or the most important asset that everyone in this room has is the data uh, that you have, which is yours, except it's locked up sometimes in silos. So the partnership that we formed with SAP was to say, OK, if we unlock this data uh, and really help each of you enrich this data, so that all of what you do across the enterprise, how you connect with customers, or how you manage your supply chain, or how you even drive an initiative like your sustainability, can all be driven through all of the data. In fact, the key definition I have for an AI-first company, an AI-first company is not a company that just takes, say, data in their CRM systems and makes their customer management better. You have to take all of the data you have, irrespective of in which system it is, and make your customer interaction better, right? So that ability to continuously optimize your outcomes 
using all of your data is really key. And the only way to do that is by really having initiatives like ODI unlock the power of the data. So that's kind of where my excitement for this comes from. Well, you talked about sustainability, sustainability and maybe I'll bring Ben Tepfer out there. We're both engineers. And so I thought we could maybe just geek out a little bit and show a little bit of the progress that oh, great. the Let's two companies that, yeah. have made uh, you know, with ODI, with Unilever. That's right. Awesome. Take it away, Ben. Wow. All right, well, hey, guys. So in a transformative move, Unilever has committed that by 2025, they'll make all of their packaging around plastics reusable, compostable, or, or recyclable. And I'm super excited today to share with you the vision of how, right? And I'm so excited to share with you this vision that we're going on with ODI to help make this a reality between Microsoft, SAP, and Adobe. And I want to start off by thanking Unilever for letting us share this story, use their brand, and let you know that all the data you'll see is fictitious to respect their customers' privacy. So today I'm going to play the role of a data analyst for Unilever. And my goal is to build out an audience of eco-conscious consumers who we can talk to about the new product packaging. And I'm going to start here in the experience platform. So what I need to do to build out this audience is... And this is all running right now on, on Microsoft Azure. On Microsoft Azure. Thank you, Sean. Exactly. Yes, this is all running on Microsoft Azure. <laughs> it's good to know. It's good, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> and what I need to do is bring together data across the enterprise, right? And so some of these things I already have here in the system, such as my Adobe Analytics data, which I've already shared to the customer data lake, as well as my consent data. So we understand our customers' permissions and preferences through the whole journey. Now that's a pretty key thing. Right? It's absolutely critical, yes. And what, what we also need to bring in now is data around consumption of plastics. And, so to do that, I'll come to the Open Data Initiative tab here, and this is where I can access data across application boundaries without the need to manually import and export. And so to build out our use case here, we need to bring in some data from SAP. So our composition data. This is what is the product made out of, what is the packaging made out of. And then our logistics. What does the supply chain and the inventory look like? And this is really important for marketers because we need to market products that are available in our certain regions. And so once we bring these in, we're ready to take action on these sets of data. And to do that, I'm going to come into Data Science Workspace and run one of our machine learning models. So we have a whole bunch of models here. I'm going to focus on our eco-conscious consumers one. And this is where I bring together all those types of data. And this is where the magic really begins to happen. Because I can now understand the correlation and build out an audience to talk to about this eco-conscious eco program here. So we have talked to you about how we bring data into the experience platform. I've talked about sharing it to the customer data lake and running machine learning. Now, as Unilever continues to progress, they're going to be needing to visualize and understand the results here. And so to do that, I will, I'm going to hit the right button. Ooh. We're trying to move. There we go. Okay. Got it. Uh, I'm going to switch over to Microsoft Power BI using the experience platform running on Azure. And so here I'm able to see visualizations that I'm immediately able to take action on. Right? So every individual in the enterprise can focus on the KPIs that they need to re deliver the, re the repackaging. And I can also understand the attributes that go into the segments. Why did people make purchases? And I can take action on that. And ODI really begins to light up in the customer journey, right? Everywhere from advertising to marketing and sales. And so the next time a user in our eco-conscious segment engages with Unilever, we're able to deliver this personalized, awesome. tailored experience to them. And really, this is the power of ODI, bringing together data in an actionable way that empowers us as marketers to deliver these experiences. It's awesome. It's great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. It's really nice to see when we start to put our minds on doing something, how, my, how quickly the engineering teams have been able to deliver. Yeah, and I was very excited. The, the key thing for me, which even I would not seen this particular use case, but it's so nice to see the data not being locked up, right? The fact that you can think about your sustainability effort as an end-to-end -end uh, process from how your customer experience works to your supply chain data. That, to me, is the unlock, uh, where we are not thinking about processes narrowly, but much more end-to-end, -end, and I'm really excited to see the progress. Maybe two uh, questions, uh, Satya, to uh, bring this uh, to a close. The first is sort of tech trends. What do you see on the horizon? AI, ML, quantum computing, mixed reality? What's, what's top of mind? I mean, the, the first thing is, Whenever I think, wow, this is amazing, we've now got lots of computing, uh, you realize that you don't have enough of it. In other words, 
uh, you need more computing, not less. And it needs to be ubiquitous. And for example, take what we are trying to do with our own Xbox and with xCloud, right? We've talked about how uh, we're gonna be able to, in a 5G network, stream uh, that to your phone. You put an Xbox controller, play a AAA game, uh, and I think that's gonna be imminently be possible anywhere in the world uh, with the rollout of 5G. So that's essentially taking the power of the cloud and being able to project it with low latency to any part, which is just stunning. But it's not just that. They take HoloLens as another example. HoloLens is actually a, a computer which is a distributed computer. In other words, you have a neural processor which interprets the world, then places holograms by understanding the physics of the world, but then it can even tap into the po po power of GPUs in the cloud for pushing more polygons uh, in the physical world, right? So it's not even bound to the compute power only on the device. So it's got the infinite capacity of the cloud plus low latency capacity to interpret the world uh, you know, at the edge. That's phenomenal to see. Uh, then you take, say, something like language. Uh, if you think about the type of breakthroughs in AI, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm most blown away is the ability for these deep learning techniques, not just in perception, right? So it's not about just speech recognition or machine translation or object identification or computer vision. Now it's in the core language models. Uh, the ability to uh, do machine reading and comprehension at scale, unsupervised, is just stunning. Uh, and also the techniques of being able to take multiple sensors. So the fact that you can now take your computer imagery and ground language. If you and I are talking, we're now talking with both our gestures and speech. How do you teach computers that ability to take both? Right. Uh, and that to me is the next frontier is to take all of these AI techniques. And lastly, you brought up HoloLens. To me, even on the user experience side, the in HoloLens V1, for example, we used to say we have gestures, gaze, speech, except they were still rigid, right? You needed to use gestures for a specific set of use cases. You needed to do speech for some things. What if we made the entire experience instinctual? It's not like in human life, I pick and choose. I use multiple modes depending on what, the modal what I want to do. And so really this breakthrough around instinctual user experience, I can touch, I can speak, I can gesture, I can gaze, all depending on what I want to do, and do it not only on one device, but any device. Uh, so these are the three broad trends I'm excited about, and, and quite frankly, I think they're going to be transformative in all the vertical industries we talk about. I'll make a commitment to you. You find infinite bandwidth for us. With our creative tools, we'll find a way to use it. <laughs> Maybe the last question. I mean, this is an audience. Uh, we have CIOs, we have CMOs uh, talking about sort of the future of enterprise and business transformation. What's your message uh, to folks here? It's a great one. I mean, especially given that combination of CIO and CMO, let's face it. I mean, one of the things that is the hardest thing to do, perhaps, is to try and predict with high precision exactly what consumers are going to like or what is consumer behavior you know, out into the future, right? It's sort of, for anyone, uh, it's a B2B customer or a B2C customer. It's the key is they will, their own expectations of what you produce and what you create is going to keep changing, and you gotta keep up with it. So one of the things that at least I think about, even in our own sort of capacity to innovate, is what I call the no regrets move, which is, how do we build the long-term systems? Uh, how do you create that experimentation harness even on top of these systems? We talked a lot about, let's say, something like ODI, your data lake, your experience cloud infrastructure. Let's say you lay all that. Then the key is for you to build the social side of how do you rapidly, continuously experiment uh, create, in fact, one of the measures we are trying to create internally for everything we do is how quickly are people rewarded for disproving their hypothesis, right? I mean, instead of saying, okay, you gotta be right all the time, in fact, we've gotta give credit to people who come up with hypotheses and prove themselves wrong. Uh, and so that's as much culture as its systems. Uh, 
so that's at least what we are learning, and I think that's the one piece of advice, I think, especially that combination of CMO and CIO, uh, I think are the uniquely capable of creating that no regret system investment, which allows every company here to thrive in what is an increasingly digital age. As always, Satya, it's so great to see you. We really, really appreciate uh, your being at Adobe Summit. Uh, please join me in thanking Satya Nadella. Thank you so much. Thank you.